Turtles all the way down. I'm Jake, sometimes Jenk. I think the introductory monologues have been perhaps getting a little too long lately, so this one's going to be very short. Um, my friend Rodrigo is visiting this week from Montreal, and the last time he was here, which was just before the solstice holidays, uh, we had a conversation with the microphones on, and uh, this is going to be our episode. He was, of course, the first guest that we had on Turtles All the Way Down and had some part in the naming of the uh, podcast as well. So here he is back for a second time. Oh, and by the way, uh, on the night of the solstice, I probably had a couple too many drinks, uh, got a little nervous and uh, chickened out. Um, so the the experiment of hybridizing the monologue with a pseudo stand-up comedy routine didn't happen that to come uh either way enjoy this conversation rodrigo back for the second time talk soon uh i have a question i have a question for you sure uh because you know normally you interview people on your podcast i figure well i've been interviewing my entire life too and interested Mm. about it but um uh, so uh, I touched on it a little bit earlier. We were out eating and stuff. Um, but, uh, well, number one, how's, how's the podcast going? Like, is it, has it kind of, uh, fulfilled or is it in the process of fulfilling the expectations that you kind of set up for it? Or is it doing yeah. what you hoped it would do? Uh, yeah, it's going really well. Uh, uh it, it was kind of, um, <clears throat> I guess it's one of these things I probably had in the back of my mind for a long time, but didn't really talk about it. Uh, until about uh, May or so, roughly the timeline, May, June. And then soon after, uh, like within a month, we're starting to record uh, some of these episodes. And uh, it was in the summertime when we recorded your first episode. Uh, you know, I sent it out for uh, preview listening to some of my friends and it got, uh, you know, good reviews all around for, for uh, the ones that people have heard. And recently we put it on iTunes. Nice. So we've got it on the podcast app and... Uh, People are liking it. And, and, people, wh- and what yeah. uh, what's your criteria for bringing somebody on your show? Uh, just if they're going to be an interesting conversation for me, really, that that's pretty much what it boils down to. And it is a conversation podcast as opposed to an interview. Right. So, so it's you, closer you, to a 50-50 kind of a, right. a talk. So you're looking for mm. interesting people. Yeah. People who you think might... <clears throat> might uh, mm. might uh, give a good conversation. Well, yeah. Uh, I tend to uh, be you know, often on or uh, around the meta level of things. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I like to talk about talking maybe. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> or, you Which know. is what we're doing right now. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's another Bingo. layer of the turtle. It's <laughs> a lot of work. Mm. But, uh, you know, I've, we've got this launch party coming up soon where we're officially going to launch. Yeah. And, um, and hopefully before then we'll have a few more episodes released. It's uh, it's funny though when you when you put it on iTunes and you've got it on the podcast app and it's there on the list uh, you know beside all the other uh, uh, podcasts that are somewhat well known it seems a lot more real mm-hmm. like all of a sudden people start to, oh this is actually a podcast mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it's not just some guy talking uh, right. hey I'm starting right. a podcast which I'd probably hear a lot and I would have been one of these guys like eight ten years ago when I said hey I'm going to do a podcast and never got around to it. But uh, it does take some doing, and I got, I've had a bunch of help to do that. <clears throat> you know, the back-end stuff. And, uh, you might want to send out some shout-outs at this point. Yeah, like uh, Claire uh, has been uh, producing and organizing and uh, setting up, uh, you know, we have our breakfast meetings before, uh, usually before a conversation. Today, you just happened to be in and around and popped in, Yeah, and we're talking. Um, and uh, we have a, a very talented artist, connected with us who goes by the name of public grin who's doing ah, all yeah. the uh, like the posters and invites and uh, t-shirts and everything and uh, i think it's all yeah pretty cool shit well that's definitely yeah. uh you know talk about uh making it seem real mm-hmm. that's the next step you know mm-hmm. once you have that in place it is real it's mm-hmm. inescapable it's there yeah uh looks really nice mm-hmm. by the way um and i like that the title of your podcast too. <laughs> yeah. You had something with uh, to do with that. Uh, yeah, I think it fits. 
<clears throat> and, and it lends itself visually to these uh, nice posters and pictures. And yeah. Icons. Now, have you, again, something we touched on a, a little bit, but uh, I wanted you to elaborate on it a bit more. But so, you know, uh, what have you learned or so far? It's still very early in your journey. Yeah. But, you know, you're a good 12 episodes in at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, what, are you, what have you learned, even if it's about podcasting, even if it's about mm. conversation or the people you've brought on, or have you always been right about them being interesting? Uh, most of the time. Yeah. Uh, you know, and most of the people I've, I've interviewed are people that I've known in advance of this. So that takes out a, some of that variability. Uh, I guess the challenge is, is uh, with people that I haven't, met and and sometimes you don't know what to expect you know what kind of a conversation you're going to have and it's a conversation again i you know i have to uh so there's a lot of give and take back and forth so there's got to be a dynamic that works and uh i mean there it's not that you know i we probably recorded about 15 or 16 episodes uh but we're probably gonna only release about 10 or 11 of them uh, right you know uh so not all of them work ah okay not all of them uh, uh flow but uh but I mean, in the end, I might end up releasing all of them anyway, just because I I don't like to right. leave any gap, right. <laughs> waste anything. Yeah, and there's really no editing either. Uh, you know, in, in in almost every case, unless there was a technical glitch or uh, there was a bathroom break, there's, right. there's no editing really. Well, good thing I brought my diapers this time. <laughs> no well, bathroom breaks. Bathroom breaks are allowed usually an hour into it. <laughs> yeah. So uh, and uh, you know, a lot of these podcasters that are successful seem to be. Stand-up comedians, which is kind of ah. an interesting thing. And I'm mm. kind of doing it uh, bass backwards in mm-hmm. a way that I'm going to start a podcast first and then probably try my hand at stand-up comedy after. So, that's something that's yeah. it's come up uh, with people that I've known, mm. uh, that I know recently, uh, that it seems to be um, just this thing that people try at some point. Mm-hmm. What, what what do you see in stand up uh, comedy that what's what appeals to you about that well um i have tried it once mm-hmm. I, I went up on an open mic uh, for 5 minute set and uh it was easier than i thought for one thing cuz oh, yeah. to me i always thought it would be something that i wanted to do but would be incredibly terrifying sure it turned out not to be terrifying okay so that's kind of an interesting thing that happened um also, I feel like I'm I'm very much a student of comedy. I mean, all, hmm. as long as I can remember, uh, I watched a lot of comedy on TV and movies, and I remember thinking in ter- in from the perspective of the comedy writer most of the time. Like mm-hmm. I always found myself watching something funny and thinking, "Oh, you, you know, the writer did it this way or that way, or what have said yeah, this maybe, yeah. or use that turn of phrase." Or, so oh. I, I kept noticing how it was put together and and conceived. So. You know, there's there's that conceit that you think, oh, I, I've seen so much of it that I could probably do it. But who knows? You right. won't know until you try. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, the first attempt at it was pretty good. Yeah. I think I might be able to pull something off. How so, long was that first attempt? It's five minutes. Right. <clears throat> so it was a very conservative first attempt. Yeah. But without <laughs> any planning and improvised. Yeah, that's pretty yeah. good. And, uh, well, here, here's the thing. I've got this uh, launch on the 21st. Yeah. Which is the uh, solstice. And, yeah. um you know, there's going to be some people there. It's kind of a wine and cheese. But at some point, there's going to be a couple of DJs playing. I'm probably going to take the mic and say a few words, which will essentially be kind of like a monologue that I do at the beginning of each of these episodes, but different in the sense that it's going to be in front of a live crowd. So it's also kind of like a stand-up sure. comedy routine. Sure, It's kind of a hybrid of the two. So it'll be an interesting experiment to see. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> oh, I like that and how that goes. And uh, maybe develop that side of my performance art, which is to come, which yeah. is not really comedy. It would be more like storytelling. Yeah. More like the monologues that I do. Well, I find that in my case, uh, that's what makes the most interesting comedy is when somebody, you know, is talking about something. It has something to say. So the com- mm-hmm. the comedy is not... It's incidental almost. It's kind of incidental mm-hmm. or... <clears throat> It's the flavor of the <clears throat> mm-hmm. of the monologue of the speech, but yeah. uh, you know, I can think of no one better than George Carlin. Well, you know, the greats George Carlin and mm-hmm. uh, uh, Richard Pryor too. You know, there's mm-hmm. a lot of stuff where he's just he's just telling to you in a very funny way, but he's communicating yeah. a lot of stuff. It's very autobiographical, mm-hmm. or in the case of George Carlin, very political. Um, but there's a lot of meat, uh, yeah. and. 
personally speaking, I don't know, whenever I've seen stand-up uh, comedians that are, it's just a joke. It's the punchline. Mm-hmm. I, I find it kind of tedious. and. Mm-hmm. I but th- those ones aren't as interesting, and they tend to be more on the you know like the uh, the cruise ship type of performers where they're trying to you know appeal to the lowest common denominator, and, and, yeah. you know not taking very many risks. But the comedy that I find interesting are the ones that are maybe more honest and revealing about themselves. That that tends to open up a whole other realm, but also a little absurd. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, enjoy the uh, absurd and risk taking. Yeah, which. Uh, is more comedies, is it? It's actually a golden age of comedy, it seems like. There's a lot of interesting comedians out there. Because I remember, actually, in, way back in high school, mm. they had kind of a comedy boom. I don't know if you remember this, like Yuck Yucks uh, was yeah. a chain that started opening up in a whole bunch of comedy clubs. Are and they still this, going, Yuck Yucks? I don't even know. I think they are. Yeah. But it became, so, and, and I even, uh, you know, used to, you know, I was underage, but I would go to comedy clubs occasionally and, and watch and i realized very quickly that it started to become kind of a repetitive hack kind of a thing uh, you just had these same kind of comedians coming up telling the same kind of jokes and yeah. you know it just seemed like well this isn't going anywhere as an art form and, and yeah. i kind of stopped paying attention to it for a long time but uh there's now a resurgence i mean there's a lot of interesting comedy happening and i think probably the internet has a lot to do with that because these people you know put up these bizarre videos of their own on YouTube and, right. you know, built a career for themselves some, in some cases just doing that. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, there's lots of room. I- I- to internet be. has to do with everything. Pretty much. But, yeah. Um, well, that's really interesting. I, I um, yeah, it's, it's a topic I don't know too much about, but obviously, you know, mm. very uh, uh, open to it. Um, and uh, I'm very picky with humor, though, I find. Mm. I don't know if it's the same thing for you, mm. um, you know, and uh, I've often said in interviews that humor is a little bit like horror too, in the sense that you don't have a, mm. you don't have a choice as to whether you, <laughs> uh, you know, you, you get frightened or not and you don't right. really have a choice whether you're going to laugh or not. It's, it's either going to happen or mm-hmm. I guess the same thing for arousal really. Right. So, you know, it's it's very... Uh, because it's more of a reaction of yeah. the unconscious, of the body, is that... Yeah, it's, it's a lot more instinctive. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, I guess it's hitting you, yeah, somewhere deep in your brain first, and then your, your conscious uh, mind or mm. your, you know, your rational mind is, is sort of responds afterwards. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It seems like much of our behavior is kind of like that in the sense that we, we, we kind of respond without thought and then we marshal our resources of intellect to rationalize what we just did. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. That's I exactly that the way it is. tends to be going on all the time. Well, yeah. sure. I think even the most uh, rational-minded people are only so rational, you know, mm-hmm. um, yeah, it's it really is your 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 senses, your body, your emotions, everything mm-hmm. is kind of involved, and then your brain is kind of trying to make sense out of it all. Mm-hmm. But what's what's there first? It's definitely not the brain. Yeah, that tends to come lagging behind often uh, in the experience, but yeah. uh, but we don't register it often until it is a thought. Uh, sometimes, so we retroactively justify well we retroactively i think give it give it pr- uh, prominence where mm-hmm. it's something you know what i mean the, mm-hmm. the brain retroactively it sort of gets the credit right mm-hmm. wasn't it plato's uh thing where the uh the the mind is uh the charioteer and that oh, entire yeah. thing right <clears throat> um and the charioteer is the thing that guides everything or keeps mm-hmm. them in line mm-hmm. um did you did you see that um uh was that animated film <laughs> Never a little girl's brain there, there was this recently uh, a pixar film uh-huh. where uh basically it's animated and you see inside the the brain of a child oh and shit they I have totally like missed different that movie. uh different segments of it kind of uh, oh. you have like your fear center your oh center, that's that cool kind of talking uh you know uh, i'd be interested manifesting in seeing that. into yeah. characters the uh-huh. aspects of the personality i guess you could say uh-huh. and, and i kind of like that that approach to things because I, I think of it somewhat loosely in that way but obviously not so uh, organized as as you might say but in that there's a lot of processes that play within us that mm-hmm. are kind of at odds with each other 
And there's some kind of an organizing principle. And, you know, some might say that's <clears throat> the self or the ego or the intellect organizing. But I don't even know if you need to posit anything like that. It's just the swirl kind of self-organizes. And that's maybe the mystery of consciousness. It's that, that complicated swirl that takes on a behavioral pattern that we call consciousness. And we have this bizarre perspective from within, which right. is baffling. <laughs> There's a, interestingly, uh, I was just, I'm reading a book called, um, oh God, I think, uh, Paranorm, uh, something about the paranormal. So I'm hmm. usually quite good with my book titles, but I just started it. Um, but uh, there's this gentleman discussing what the, uh, uh, you know, where uh, essentially, uh, you know, in, in terms of paranormal experiences and stuff, mm -hmm. um, it, he's talking about how the body can fool itself. One of the reasons why the body can fool itself is because it's always, the body's always asking via your sense experience and so on where you are. Right. Right? So are you inside of your... Uh, like where are you exactly? Mm -hmm. Is is your you, you know your body? You you typically think of yourself. Oh, I'm. It in my seems head. like I'm behind my eyes somewhere. Right. It seems like maybe the third eye type of a position if you're right. thinking positionally. Yeah. So there's a there's a, an interesting um, exercise that mm -hmm. we can do. We should we should try it. I haven't tried it out yet, but mm. where you can fool your body into thinking it's somewhere else. Mm. Um, part of this is uh, involves uh, having a book. Uh, sort of uh, on its edge, so it's like a little divider. Mm -hmm. You put your arm on one side, okay. and you put like a fake hand on the other, right. and you drape a little uh, cloth over it, mm -hmm. and uh, you essentially uh, caress the hand, and then mm -hmm. you caress the, uh, mm -hmm. the uh, fake hand at the same time, or somebody does it for you. Right. And eventually, over the course of a minute, your body will think that the fake hand is the real hand. Yeah. We right? adjust to the... The yeah, reality it'll, we're presented. Right, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. So it'll it'll completely confuse, mm -hmm. and it'll essentially mm -hmm. tell you that this fake hand is you, right? You know, yeah. you you are you are suddenly now. That's amazing. Yeah, it's pretty it's pretty wild. Mm -hmm. There's all these other these other uh, exercises you can do. Uh, yeah, I mean that that just points to how um, easily we're going to get pulled into the virtual reality realm oh yeah you know like once you spend i mean this is what people say once you spend a minute in there you start to become convinced that you're actually walking where you are and seeing what you're seeing and your hands are such or what have you so imagine if they become even more uh, impressive in their uh, fidelity to what we're used to experiencing and then you start to you know pretty quickly jump in and think uh i can imagine people getting confused eventually like where's oh, my yeah. reality what time is it what day is it what's the truth i mean we're kind of having surface versions of that already. People who spend a lot of time online, people who spend a lot of time on Facebook yeah. might not know what the truth of the matter is when it comes to politics or economics or climatology or what have you. I mean, it's all confusion all the way down right now. Yeah. Imagine being immersed in that reality where it's, you're, you're in all dimensions. And uh, I can see confusion getting deeper. And, uh, you know, what I call a dissociative state of, of culture that's already begun. Right. So the future is a little nutty. So with, yeah. with confu you mean by confusion, you mean sp specifically that people will sort of have no center or what is it exactly? It'll mean? just be easier to be confused. I'm not saying that people will completely lose touch with reality, but hmm. some might. And those that are easily, more easily lose touch with reality will be much more inclined to lose touch with what we call consistent base reality, what have you. Mm. There's just going to be more, um, you know, dissociative means that, you know, there's various um, dysfunctional ways of being dissociative, whether you're not sure about yourself or where you, who you are, or where it begins or ends. You, you're dissociated about time, uh, like what day is it, what year is it, uh, about truth, which we uh, which is already uh, already happening, and you know all kinds there. of basically in truth in general, in the sense that what is the case mm -hmm. can have multiple answers that start to take on uh, validity and strength of their own, so that it becomes more and more difficult to say ah this is what's going on. The question mm -hmm. will be more often oh oh wait what's going oh yeah that's what's going on. Like it's it's going to be not necessarily clear as we act. 
uh, not everyone, but uh, people that uh, you know spend a lot of time within, which <laughs> sounds a lot like on the road to the matrix. <laughs> well, but yeah, I think uh, my experience with people who are uh, in that state is that they convince themselves of something else, of a different kind of reality, a different set of truths. In a way, they seem to be more... Uh, I mean, they're more confused, clearly, mm -hmm. but but subjectively, they're less confused. They seem mm -hmm. to kind of have a there's very... There's a certainty comes over. There's them. a certainty that, that, um, mm. uh, that, that takes over. Mm. Uh, I, I think it's quite dangerous, clearly. Mm -hmm. It has a lot of dangers to it. Mm -hmm. um, you know the more certain you are about things that are not factual, not real, mm -hmm. you know, it can lead you down a very, mm -hmm. very bad path, which I think we're seeing this quite a bit in, um, in the, uh, the social media, uh, so social network media mm -hmm. for lack of a better term. But, um, but yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, looking at it from the outside, certainly a type of confusion, Mm -hmm. Um, but it's also this strange, I don't know, people kind of, you know, they build their own little tr t mm -hmm. uh, structures of truth, their little towers, their little, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And they, and they're, they're really devoted to these things and it's really hard to. There seems to be more of these customized versions of truth now, whereas used to be maybe a handful of warring sides in terms of hey this is reality or this is reality it seems right. like everyone has their own private reality <laughs> right you know based on the algorithms at play that are feeding the the media stream into their into their world view mm. everyone's kind of getting a customized uh, uh you know hose of information and truth fed to them and mm. it's it's creating their own reality that's maybe unique to themselves yeah more so that, than it's ever been yeah. absolutely and i think a lot of people you know <clears throat> don't know uh, the difference between uh, systematic rational thought and just mm. grabbing anything that may seem sensible to them on any given mm -hmm. minute, right? Yeah. Um, so uh, th I think the, one of the big fallouts to that is that the dialogue, the possibilities for dialogue become completely compromised. Mm -hmm. And you're seeing that right now with the, uh, the so-called... Uh, well, the f is it the, what do they call it? The fake news, fake news the, 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 the conspiracies, yeah. and and uh, you know, it's a kind of a free for all mm -hmm. right now, and it's really difficult for the uh, you know, it, it's like a little bit like talking to a Jehovah Witness. You, mm -hmm. you kind of can't win. You, you, yeah, you know, you, you can't. It's a rabbit hole. Like once, it's a once you're hole. down there, or it's a, you know, like an infinite turtle regress or something. Because once you're in there, yeah, right. Um, so my favorite one, mm -hmm. which we talked about already, but I looked into since I talked to you, is the f this whole idea that the Earth is actually flat. <laughs> right. And, uh, you know, it came up a few times, and, mm -hmm. um, you know, I thought it was kind of a big joke, which in some way it still is, but mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of people who, a lot of a, a significant number of people mm. who should clearly know better, yeah, because they live in a in a you know in a, in a they have access to the internet, they have mm -hmm. access to education, you know, they've been educated mm -hmm. uh, to a certain extent, and, um, and they, they think GPS. the world is flat. <laughs> <laughs> GPS works, <so> <laughs> <laughs> but you know if the <laughs> you know I mean. Uh, and, uh, you know, from what I can tell, I mean, talking mm -hmm. to someone about whether the world is flat or not is um, got to be really difficult, I think. <laughs> I did not think, you know, <laughs> when I was a kid in the 70s, like discovering the world of science and knowledge and, you know, thinking back as to, you know, how far we've come in the thousands of years and the Enlightenment. I did not think in 2016 we would be having to talk about discussing with someone whether or not the earth was flat <laughs> like what the fuck happened <laughs> you know well is it, there there you have it right it's the that's the danger right there um, yeah. it's 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 right there we're not even <laughs> like you mentioned virtual reality and that's going to exacerbate things yeah um because you will be literally in the machine mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. um and once you're in that cocoon I mean, already, 
Some people are easily led by these video games with little hand controllers and right. they get sucked into it and you can't pry them away. Imagine oh, yeah. putting those people in an immersive virtual right. realm. Right. They're never getting out. Oh, they're never going to get out. <laughs> they're in there. They're never going to get out. And hopefully, no. I mean, and I'm sure there will be lots of great things that we can explore um, through VR and maybe a lot of really great things oh, yeah. that can come out like of it. Like any technology. Yeah. There's going to be some great things and there's going to be some unintended consequences that are going to... Yeah, problems we can't even imagine right now, and joys we can't imagine. That's all true. But we keep doing it. Why not? Well, we have no choice. Well, unless, yeah. I mean, this is the thing. It, it, you know, it, it always comes back to, um, like, two figures, uh, two human figures that I, that, I, that I think of. It's like uh, that are at opposing ends of the how to look at this technological, impending technological complexity, and you have your uh, Ray Kurzweil, of the of the singularity theory and yeah. really a very optimistic view of the future in terms of technology right you know progressing at a certain rate that could even be mathematically projected into the future and then from that you say that around you know maybe the year 2042 or 2050 you have kind of a singularity point so you have this kind of a a utopian way of looking at the future and the technology going along a trajectory that's going to bring us to kind of an infinite singularity point. Mm. And then you have the other side, which I think of is kind of like the uh, Ted Kaczynski Unabomber ah. kind of an approach. Okay. Uh, another brilliant guy. Uh-huh. Was brilliant, but he was also a little nutty. Sure. And, Maybe uh, more than a little. you know, he, but if you look at his uh, views on technology, taking away some of the, the delusional parts of it, a lot of it is based on uh, what is a natural reaction to uh the current complexity of technological innovation, you know, and then projecting that onto the future. And he comes to the conclusion that we're fucked. Okay. <laughs> and that the only way to get around that is to stop it now. So his whole approach was just get the message out there, start bombing people that are involved in technology because his thing was we need it to stop, not mm-hmm. just slow down, but like you got to stop. stop it. because. And why? Or? I think he's essentially looking ahead to what we're talking about, like the super intelligent AI, for example. Uh, but that's just one way this technological trajectory can go wrong. That is, you have the super intelligent AI that, that can take over and make us obviate a, the need for humans at all. Uh, it could be some biotechnological thing that we do that, that causes some kind of a pandemic. It could cause some kind of a disease. I mean, there's there's that root of technology fucking us over. There's the information. Uh, there's cultural reasons. But the thing is, uh, I, I think someone like him, he looks through all the extrapolations and thinks all of these lead to bad news for the human. Right. So let's stop it now. And that's kind of like the Luddite reaction. Um both of them, I think, are too simplistic. Sure. You know, uh, Kurzweil probably just far too optimistic. Everything, you know, he thinks that essentially we're all going to be immortal. Yeah. If we just hang on for another 20, 30 years. Do we even <clears> want to be immortal? Or? I don't know. Yeah. Well, I want to live maybe a few hundred years, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, what do you think? So? <clears throat> I don't know. I think, uh, I've, I've, um, I think my views about mortality have changed over the past mm-hmm. little while. I th- obviously, uh, when I was younger, I thought, well, you know, the longer the better, the mm-hmm. more the better. I can mm-hmm. totally, um, you know, handle living uh, mm-hmm. several hundred years, if not more. Um, but I don't know, something happened over the course of my life where I've kind of changed my views. It seems to me that... Uh, uh, if you, you know, without the, th- the threat of death or the, the reality of death, mm-hmm. that life in a way kind of makes less sense. It's just, it's not mm-hmm. as, uh, true important. It's not as special in a way. You know what I mean? It's just, it doesn't put it in a context. It's like when you have the finitude of mortality, the context within which it resides makes it valuable. If there's an infinitude, it almost seems like where does the value of it go? If, if sure. It's an endless I, supply. Of yeah. It. I, I think that a, a, a very long life can also be extremely uh, tedious and boring. Oh, I would think for most you know, people it would yeah. be. Yeah. I mean, you, your body starts to break down after a certain point. You know, well, it's not like you can go out and play tennis when you're Well, like this 95. is the thing. For me, the assumption is that we, we solve that problem otherwise. Uh, like... With with these stem cells and uh, nanotechnology, whatever the point and three D printing, you could print replacement parts. I mean, not that it's going to be 
practically or politically or socially con- you know, conceivable mm-hmm. that we're going to have everybody just replacing their parts. But mm-hmm. it's possible technologically mm-hmm. to, to have that quite soon. Where you imagine if something wears out, you replace it. You know, uh-huh. so technically you should be able to extend life a great deal. I mean, there mm-hmm. could be other kinds of problems, like maybe something about the neurons uh, or, or such that, or telomeres or what have you. But it seems like we're figuring stuff out, not to make it in, you mm-hmm. know, a complete understanding, but at mm-hmm. least extension is quite possible. Yeah, well, that might be the case. I just don't know if the... I mean, the will to live, I think, is yeah. and the and the interest. Well, most people, it would be uh, yeah, because I think if you yeah. don't like uh, the company of your own thoughts, you're probably going to hate immortality. It's probably going to be a hell. Because <laughs> I'm guessing right? you would spend a lot of that time alone with your thoughts, probably. Well, I guess unless you're connected into this super connected virtual realm well, where you yeah, you're that's part another, of this that's whole anyway. So you're, you're yeah. even, even your sense of individuality might disappear. Well, that's a, like, that's an interesting, uh, there's that um, really great episode of a show called Black Mirror that explores hmm. that, uh, the idea of uh, essentially the afterlife as a VR program. Oh yeah. I saw, I saw that. that. Mm-hmm. But uh, in the context of this conversation, more mm-hmm. uh, as your body breaks down, and uh, you're not able to ambulate or move mm. around or your body, then maybe you start entering these VR yeah. worlds. And that's uh, another option. It's even easier once you get that right. You don't have to mess with the messy body. As right. Long as <laughs> you, just, you just dissipate into the... <laughs> but see, I, I, yeah, I think we're still going to need a body. Uh-huh. Right. I, I mean, this is the thing about the Kurzweilian singularity approach is that he seems to think that we'll be able to download... Yeah are being into software only, which I think is going to not be as easy as we think, and it won't be the same yeah. thing. It's almost like the reason we are who we are is because we have the body in such the way that it is, right. and it has a history. Your body has a history of living on this planet for more right. than 40 years, and it's developed all kinds of memories. And Well, I mean, arguably, we are the body, right? Yeah. There is nothing else. Yeah. Um, so moving the... Uh, there is no... I'm not saying I believe this, okay, but mm-hmm. maybe there is no software. You mm-hmm. can't move the software. It's just hardware. Yeah. I'm more, uh, yeah. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, so re uh, maybe the stem cell stuff, you know, mm-hmm. keeping the machine going forever would be the only way around it. Maybe. Um, again, I'm not too sure. I'd like to, I'd like to believe in, uh, in a soul and so on that lives forever. And certainly some of the, uh, as I understand them anyway, some of the modern theories mm. of, uh, of uh, parallel universes and mm. so on and so forth yeah. open a door or make it, you know, at least a, a possibility mm. that can be discussed. Um, Maybe, but it seems like we're clutching at straws with those kind of things. It's like uh, I have no reason to believe, no I mean, reason is, is maybe like in the most general sense. I, uh, there's no occasion for me to think that I need to believe in a soul. I mean, everything else is explained without positing a soul. And mm-hmm. in fact, when you, once you do posit a soul, it, a lot of things just sound, don't make sense anymore. Mm. So the only reason that one would strictly try to uh, advance that seems like wishful thinking. It's mm. like you want there to be a soul. Mm-hmm. So you're kind of contorting your mm-hmm. reason in a way to try and make sense of it. But it's so much more, you know, Occam's razor approach. It's so much easier just not to posit that at all. I mean, you you have you have an understanding of how we work within, you know, how like I said, a, like a cyclonic movement of activity with nothing at its core. And that that works as an explanation just as well. So I take it you uh well, not that <clears throat> you don't believe in ghosts or anything of that nature. No, no. Never seen a ghost? <clears throat> no. Well, if I and have felt one. seen what <laughs> felt like a ghost, I could probably think of other reasons I might be seeing that right. or experiencing that. I might not deny the experience, but that mm-hmm. doesn't, you know, it takes more than one anomalous uh, experience to, to overturn everything I know. Right. <laughs> you know? Well, I haven't seen a ghost uh, myself, uh, but um, I've known people who have of course i assess i said you know i assess the stories and stuff but it certainly gives me room for pause because there's Mm. there's um 
you know, the people that I've spoken to, they're very uh, down to earth, very aware mm -hmm. people. And uh, um, <clears throat> I don't know. It's. Uh, well, it's definitely a, a, you know a topic that's interested me and mm -hmm. uh, and I, the jury's out on it mm -hmm. um but it wouldn't seem to indicate that there is something there well it it just seems to me that like even if you look at something like first person testimony in a, in a in a legal case mm -hmm. uh, a witness testimony eyewitness testimony it's shocking how wrong people are mm -hmm. about what they've seen yeah it's almost guaranteed they're going to be mostly wrong. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the, the, the courts have started not to use that. It's, it's actually the most, it's the least reliable form of testimonies, mm -hmm. um, eyewitness testimony. And that's usually when you're in kind of, you know, you're walking down the street, you see something happen, it happens in a, in a flash, and then you tell the police, I saw this, 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 and happen. And then you look at the video feed, and it was nothing like that, but you totally believe that. That's in the normal circumstance. Now imagine if you're in a kind of a confused state or you're just kind of waking up or you maybe had something to drink. It's, mm -hmm. You could see something that could quite easily confuse you. And your brain, like you said with that hand, if you're stroking that fake hand, it starts to fill in what seems to make sense with the given information. Yeah. And when you're in a situation where you can't make sense of something, oh, that must be a ghost. Like it's, it's, it's a rational <laughs> yeah. way to get there, but it's not the best answer. And, and if it is true, it has to overturn everything else. Mm -hmm. And since everything else is not overturned, that was probably not what I saw. You know? Right. Uh, I, yes, I think what you're saying is, uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's a reasonable mm -hmm. Argument. I just uh, I think that uh, when it comes to th things about ghosts and stuff, as far as I can tell, mm -hmm. um, it's not so much um, a mental thing or, or mm -hmm. something that happens. Mm -hmm. It it seems to be uh, almost emo more emotional okay. and sort of intuitive. Mm -hmm. um, I'll even go more emotional actually. Okay. Um, so it's, um, I mean, you know, when you, sure, when you witness something and, uh, it's out of the ordinary, then mm -hmm. clearly you have to kind of, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, not, you know, look at the probabilities and sure. what's reasonable and you start checking off and chances are, well, you know, uh, but, uh, Again, my understanding, or from w the people I've talked to, that uh, a lot of it is emotionally connected. So it's not mm -hmm. necessarily that you mm -hmm. only see something, yeah, but, yeah. You, but you feel it. I get um, that. You know what I mean? And yeah. so it's a, a different, uh, there's oh. a different texture to it. But I wonder what one is saying when they say that they feel essentially a ghost. I mean, I, that kind of makes sense to me in the sense that those patterns of that person that you've probably uh, spent time with while they were alive. Uh, have presented and imprinted itself on you in some way as memories, as motions, as, uh, you, you know, ways of being, so that when you do have an experience that's emotional, yeah, you're probably recreating that. And in a sense, that person is, that experience of that person is very similar to what you would have had if they were actually present. So in a way, yeah, the spirit, if you want to call it that, of that person presents itself to you. But that's not that much different than a memory. Maybe it's a richer version of it. It's, uh, you know. Well, you're assuming that these are the cases where people know the person who's deceased. That's true. Yeah. So, um, so another case where they don't know. Yeah. That's more troubling. Right. Mm -hmm. So you have, uh, that's more what I'm, I'm mm -hmm. thinking of. Um, uh, but again, I mean, I don't know. It's. I really wish there was a little bit more um interest in this scientifically although i can see mm -hmm. that the interest that the scientific community has uh, uh taken in the past mm -hmm. uh is is very focused on it as a as a as a mental phenomenon yeah. essentially something mm -hmm. that you see and you hear through your essentially sense information yeah so clearly you're Focused on well, how how can the senses be fooled? Well, there's a million ways sure. in which the senses can be fooled. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's no, in a way, there's no contest there. It's like mm -hmm. if it, it was just about that. Right. Um, but when you're feeling, you know, you you're feeling something, you're feeling something, uh, an emotion that goes with that mm -hmm. uh, thing that you're seeing, then it suddenly becomes a little bit more. Mm -hmm. uh, it's harder to distinguish between. 
what is present and what is memory and what is the experience because it's a different kind of thing. It's not in time, essentially. Mm. Mm. Your thoughts are in time, but your emotions aren't. It's just experienced in the right. moment. So there's a confusion as to whether it's present or not, or what does present mean? Mm. You know, there's mm-hmm. a ghost present to you. The interesting thing is, mm. is that I, I th- I've come to believe that emotions are much more uh, important to people than mm. their reasoning. And the emotion comes mm. first, the reasoning comes, as we talked about yeah, earlier on this that. show. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> there's, um, uh, I don't know where I, uh, I read this, but um, uh, every, every, th- every memory you have, every, every single memory in your life that you can think of, mm. uh, has an emotion underneath it. There it's like a if you if you look at all your memories, it's mm-hmm. like a treasure map, mm-hmm. and every memory you have, you just dig, and there's an emotion. That's what's keeping the memory there. It's not the memory. Yeah, that's a big part of uh, recreating it. See, mm. memories uh, are not stored simulations. It's not like there's a video of what happened or an audio of what right. happened, right? So by all accounts, it seems like every time you have a memory, you're recreating the pathways that you had when you had that experience. It's not exactly the same. And in fact, every time you pull up that memory, it's slightly different how right. you put that together. So that recipe is put together differently each time. Mm-hmm. I and think in fact, in the mo- and the more you do it... The more you do it, less it, accurate it less is. Accurate, yeah. yeah, because it changes every time. Right. Yeah. So, uh, but the, in the case yeah. of the emotion, maybe that's right. not that's not the case. No, but what I'm saying is like that memory that you're recreating has different components, and one of the strongest components is the emotional pathways that are connected to it, and yeah. the ones that when you had that experience, the emotion that you're experiencing at the same time, that's all put together into that complex of neural firings. Mm. So when you have that memory, it comes back with the emotion, and that's going to be stronger. Uh, a pull and a stronger way to regenerate that memory than anything else. You know, smells is one, uh, yeah. and emotions. Uh, those bring it back with a lot more force. The ones mm-hmm. that are tied to strong emotions are mm-hmm. much more easily recollected. Right. Mm-hmm. But I'm wondering if the, if, the, if the memory loses accuracy as you're going mm-hmm. along, whether it retains its emotional accuracy. Mm. Right. I, w- I would guess that that would also start to alter, but maybe there's something to be said about that being less likely to be corrupted. Yeah, I, I less think... Less corruptible. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, again, my understanding is uh, we become obsessed with things mm. because there's this emotion that we're trying to... Uh, there's a knot, let's mm-hmm. say, or, you know, yeah, something there that you're trying to resolve. So many people, for example... Uh, um you can you can uh, uh tie their behavior to their lack of uh being loved say or anything like something like that right. and so it's they're, they're them trying to resolve this this emotional problem mm-hmm. that of course takes on all these different you know uh creates all these sorts of behaviors and, and, and so on. And so at, the bo- at, bo- at base, at bottom, it's still the same thing. Um, so maybe, um, you know, my feeling is that, the, that emotionally, uh, there's only a certain amount of emotions. Maybe. Arguably, there's anywhere between six and, what, 15, mm. they say? I would say it's more like between one and infinite. It's like how you, it's like colors. It's mm-hmm. how we choose, to, and different cultures will gra- gra- mm-hmm. gradate them differently. Mm. So it's just how we choose to slice that experience. Right, yeah, that makes yeah. sense. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. But we get stuck on them, mm-hmm. I think, you know? We mm-hmm. kind of obsess over it. We, we're sort of... Okay, that's that. Yeah, you know that yeah. feeling. We I do that, tend to, yeah. So you know, what I mean, like this, this girl said no to me when I was twelve. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I gotta, right? I gotta undo this, no, this rejection. I gotta, I gotta find the yes. Maybe mm-hmm. I gotta find it over and over and over, right? Mm. To to try and undo this, right? Um, so they're remarkably stubborn and they're remarkably mm-hmm. kind of fixed. It seems. Mm-hmm. Um, again, I'm. It's my impression. Certainly, I, I'm not uh, arguing that. Uh, that this is the case, um, it just feels that way. Hmm. 
So uh, that's why I think perhaps that, uh, yeah, when it comes to memory, when we look at the emotional content, it's different from mm -hmm. from from the other uh, audiovisual or the sense yeah. sensory sense uh, content. Yeah, and we all kind of pull it together differently too, because I realized um, early on actually uh, I was a part of the. It was called a Reach for the Top team in high school. Do you know what that is? It's uh, kind of like no, a quiz show. Okay. They had a TV quiz show where uh -huh. you pick a team from each school and you go on. And I realized uh, I was quite, I did quite well at that. And uh, and in grade nine, I was on the school team for, for the all of high school. And I realized that the way I was recalling, I seemed to be recalling it a lot faster. Uh, the answers was the sound of it. Like someone would ask a question and I would, it would be the sound of it that would, like it was, it was always the pattern of the sound that would come to me first. Mm -hmm. And just from that vague pattern of the sound, mm -hmm. I got the answer. It's like, I, I didn't oh, understand yeah? where it was coming from. It's like these. Sorry, can you give me an example? Like how? Uh, I don't know. Like they, they would ask something about, uh, you know, this author wrote something about such and such in 1920 or something like that. And, uh. And, you know, I'm just in grade nine. I don't even know who Sigmund Freud is. But for some reason, I connect those sounds with the word Sigmund Freud. And I hear kind of in the background, wah, wah, wah. you know, it's almost like Sigmund oh, Freud. Yeah? Like I hear the pattern of the word and then it comes into clarity. Sigmund Freud. Oh, yeah? You know, it would, it would often, the answers would just come to me as first as vague sounds and then it just click in like within microseconds. Wow. And uh, so I realized that I'm piecing it together a lot with the sound experience that I had when I was listening or learning to whatever it was. So it's definitely something that you had learned. Yeah. But, or at least vaguely connected. Wow. Like quite often I would find myself answering questions and getting them right. And, and people thinking, wow, I see so brilliant. How did you know that? And in fact, I didn't know. I just made wow. the guess that it, that word connected with that word or that concept. Uh, when somebody mentions Vienna, I think, I don't know, Sigmund right. Freud pops into my head, whatever. It, right. was, it was ways of putting it together that made it look like you knew a lot more about the details than you did. Wow, that's really interesting. <laughs> but some people might be pulling it together visually, uh, as for right. me it seems to be sonically. Some right. people might be pulling it together only emotionally, mm -hmm. and maybe they're much better at remembering. Right. Yeah, they have these... Uh, people that do like party tricks. There was some guy in Russia that could remember, you know, I don't know, like thousands of pages or whatever. And they're, they're sometimes doing that just with like an emotional landscape that they're building and they're mm -hmm. remembering it because it sticks so much more. Mm -hmm. That sounds exhausting. Your uh, example there, mm -hmm. it sounds musical the way, it you, does. The way yeah. you demonstrated it. It's almost, mm -hmm. there's yeah. like a rhythm and a beat to it, there. right? Yeah. Yeah, it's almost like the exterior meta patterns of the sound or the word is playing into the recall as much as the word itself or what it stands for. Right, right. Just the way it sounds, the way it's shaped, mm -hmm. the way it follows its mm -hmm. beat and rhythm, the way someone pronounces a name uh, is going to make me remember it as much as the name itself, just the, the, the bouncy pattern of that word. So, but that's just my personal way of doing it. Everyone, I'm guessing, does it differently. And sure. And as a result, we'll have different recall of different uh, areas. I think that uh, the more we can cross those aspects over, I think the more enriching it, it, mm. will be, it, it becomes, right? <clears throat> uh, mm. One of the things that I've always lamented about uh, our educational system is uh, the idea that everything is so compartmentalized mm. and, you know, mm -hmm. everything, you know, there's not not that sense of uh, we lack the sense of integration. How everything is truly mm -hmm. a Renaissance experience. Yeah. Everything is together. Yeah. Um, and uh, now more and more, I think we're we're kind of losing some of that. And uh, so I'm not sure if, we, if you agree, but so we're losing the uh, which part of it? Are we going towards or away from? Uh, we're. Going towards more compartmentalization. More compartmentalization. Yeah. Well, see, I wonder. Because it was kind of like, uh, it seems like that was the project of the Renaissance in a way, was to basically um, deconstruct, mm -hmm. you know, and bring everything down to its component parts, its atomist view, and then think that we understand everything because we reduced it to its uh, thing, to its uh, minimal minimal parts. But I felt like there's been a backlash to that. And uh, 
there is more what I don't know what you'd call it a holistic way of looking at things more of a and this would have been more like the later Heidegger type approach mm-hmm. and you know the postmodernist approach to things seems to be more about uh, less about compartmentalizing and more about work looking at it within larger systems mm. um, but I almost feel like we went too far that way and it's kind mm. of led us into a kind of a, a an irrational frenzy oh, interesting <laughs> yeah. so what do you mean by that uh the ir- what irrational frenzy well again I'm, I'm often maybe uh applying it to my personal experience as kind of a metaphor and analogy but it's like um you know it feels like historically in myself there was maybe too much of a sway towards the pendulum side of intellect so i go the other way and i do a lot of music and when i do i kind of go into a bit of a madness uh-huh you know, and I find myself having to pull it back, and huh. this is why I have a podcast now. Right, right. <laughs> so I don't go. So you don't go mad. Completely mad in the music because <laughs> I'm starting to float away, right. <laughs> totally dissociated, enjoying myself, but yeah. uh, and having a great uh, creative flow all the time. But uh, I found myself, for example, I have I have probably a thousand musical pieces. None of them are finished. You know, it's mm. because I just enjoy the the improvised creating of it. But where's that going to get me? I don't know if it's going to get right. me anywhere. Like I well, need it's going to get something. you a lot of enjoyment, right? <laughs> it does. But if I want to engage with the world and uh, and connect with others, I figure I got to do something else. So uh, podcast is a way to reach out to more other yeah. humans. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to come back right. more to the intellect, I guess, right, in a strange right. sort of way. Uh, well, to backtrack a little bit, though, it's interesting yeah. because I never... I, I never uh, uh, saw this uh, the way you see it in terms of mm. things being integrated. You said holistic. Maybe that's a word. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. No. I'm. I'm mm-hmm. interested though. Like, mm-hmm. um, uh, a, if you can elaborate on that a bit more. Like, how how do you see that holistic? Uh, well, uh, even. Um well, I mean, like you could look at weather and you could think of it as, well, we can just understand how each of these atoms are moving and then we can figure out where this cloud's going to go. But that's probably not the way to do it. It's mm-hmm. too complicated. It's better to look at the patterns on a on a larger mega mm-hmm. scale and find the statistical probabilities of vast trillions of these things moving around. And then you can predict a lot more about it mm-hmm. than trying to see each part. So digging into each part and understanding each part doesn't necessarily give us more information. And we found this out in a lot of systems, especially when in social systems and people and mm-hmm. uh, behavioral uh, properties of groups. We start to see that uh, knowing what the individual is going to do doesn't really tell you anything about what the group's going to do sometimes. And it's like a whole other emergent behavior is happening. So those are more the, I don't know, again, lack of a better word, holistic or what have you, like a, a broader approach rather than a reductionist approach to things. Uh, that's kind of what I mean by that. Hmm. Well, that makes sense. I think, uh, yeah, I mean... <laughs> In the end, it begs the question of how much can we know and how how, hmm. how do we, or can we know anything, really? Well, I'm starting to suspect that it's an infinite regress. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the name of this podcast, we might suggest. <laughs> we, we, we can't know anything. We're not going to get any wiser. We're well, not. we are. I think we're going to get wiser. Yeah. We're just going to take it to another layer and another level, and uh, then we're going to have to ask more questions. And, All right. Hey, how did this layer get here? What uh, happened with this? Or why does this work that way? I mean, it, it's, I think the, the, the tragic thing is that we think such things should have a final answer. It, it almost seems like this, this, this terrible feeling of nihilism comes about when you think there should be an answer and there isn't, right. and then you get pissed off. Right, sure. <laughs> that you can't find it or something. But if you realize that it's just kind of this uh, infinite, the spiraling of of information up and down various layers and frequencies to look at there is no ultimate foundational answer necessary sure then you don't really get so pissed off it's all it's <laughs> all universe. about deepening the mystery <laughs> maybe right uh, i think mm-hmm. I, I think that's my uh, mm-hmm. uh I, I resonate with that thought these days the more a lot more before i used to be very uh you know sort of focused on um I wouldn't say truth, but mm. certainties and 
And of course, once you find them, you realize, oh no, I'm fucked. <laughs> because uh, you find your certainties and you build your box and mm -hmm. uh, then suddenly there you are inside your box and who knows how long it'll take you to realize, oh shit, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so now I feel more like, well, it's outer space, it's the cosmos, and you're, you're just, you know, we just want to deepen the experience, and we're here for a little... But, so what do you mean by deepening the mystery? Is that is that a want to do? Like, it's better to deepen the mystery than yes. to solve it? It's There is no solution. There is no solution. It. It's not soluble. It's not sol. No, I don't think so. But is it preferable to have a deeper mystery? Yes. Okay. I think so. Mm -hmm. uh, you know the world life existence consciousness all these things present themselves as a, as a as a mystery as a puzzle as something that mm -hmm. that uh that um uh resists a, a solution mm -hmm. you know as you say every answer just it's it's a doorway to a bunch mm -hmm. of other questions that's not to to say that we shouldn't look for answers and certainly we can Mm -hmm. uh, find them um, personally and in terms of our ethics and in terms of our science and, you know, for sure. You know, we build principles. We have our own answers. We have our own experiences. Absolutely. But in the big context, the huge context mm -hmm. of everything, metaphysically, I guess you could say, um, you know, I think it's, it's about uh, having that awe and look and and giving yourself over to that mystery of infinity and mm. unlimited space and time mm. uh you know which is um it doesn't c happen overnight is that it, you know mm. what i mean like a, mm. as i think it's something you have to gradually uh explore and part of that exploration is to gradually uh, let go of the ego and dissolve mm -hmm. all those things. Uh, largely, I would say, uh, I don't want to use the word trauma, but uh, things that we hold on to from our from our childhood and from mm -hmm. our from you know from coming into the world that yeah. uh, these these sense of self importance and self uh, self preservation and uh living forever hmm. right it's um like perpetuating the ego is uh yeah is what that is i guess in most cases yeah i mean you you know um i don't know it just seems like uh uh the world that we live in and the world that we interact in um it, you know the human world of uh, i will say say educated uh, intellectual interaction is is a construct mm -hmm. you know what i mean and um it's it's pretty f i think uh when you look at it uh cosmically it's it's a fragile little bubble really mm. and um certainly not as we have this idea this fiction this illusion that it's it's super stable and mm. uh, yeah. it allows us there's there's so much to it and it's so complex and so vibrant and big that that you know mm -hmm. it's very very easy to walk around with your head up your ass and think that's well there's a fiction of uh, solidity and stability yeah. that is not really borne out and importance and mm -hmm. knowledge and that the system will uh, it's fixed and dependable mm -hmm. And that the sun will rise, and you know. Whereas in reality, we're all just kind of surfing on something that doesn't really have any stable uh, foundation. We're kind of uh, making everything up as we go along. <laughs> kind of, uh, I mean, I, I, I think so. And not only yeah. that, but you know, we're uh, what we know is what we've agreed upon, mm -hmm. not what is the case. Right, and. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know, the more you kind of look at it and the mm -hmm. more you, I think, have reverence for this mystery and you yeah. deepen your own personal mystery, the more you realize that this, fic, you know, this mm -hmm. fic, fictive quality about... Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, it's like, uh, we're, it sounds like we're, we're kind of talking about this. If you're, if you're looking at uh, trying to found a foundation for something, 
like your beliefs and whatever, even morals. Uh, and you find through inquiry and deconstruction that there is no such thing, that there is no stability, there is no proof, there is no uh, way that you can say that. That leads some people into a kind of a, a madness in the sense of, uh, well, that means everything is permissible. That sure. means everything is uh, as equally has foundation as the other because nothing has foundation. I don't see how that follows necessarily. It's like this is where I think the existentialists kind of get it right in the sense that we, we realize this lack of foundation that we have. <clears throat> but what that does is it highlights the importance of us as agents to create that. You know, it puts that uh, creative agency in our hands. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be furnished to us by a God. It's mm -hmm. not going to be furnished to us by the universe necessarily. There's necessarily no telos or way or direction that everything is going. Mm -hmm. And once you realize that, you can run away and hide and say, ah, nothing makes sense and everything shit. Or you can say, oh, it's up to us to make this reality. Right. And that confers you with responsibility. Sure. And um, this is, I think, what a lot of us run away from. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think there's also a lot of comfort, and this is not super popular, never has been, I don't think, but uh, in saying that we don't know, mm. claiming ignorance. And mm. um, sure, it's great to make stuff up and uh, come up with systems <clears throat> and uh, be creative, I, whether we're, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, conscious of that or not. Mm. Um but uh, not knowing is also a really, I think, a strong stance yeah. and, a, and, a, and a powerful one. Because at that point, you you kind of uh, allow anything to happen. And you mm -hmm. open yourself up in a really, really big way for for what is. And for interacting with everything just on the level of being. There's no need to to necessarily understand um, intellectually or categorize or try to, you know, I mean, clearly there's importance to doing that. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm not trying to, that. yes, I'm yeah. not trying to <laughs> say, look, mm -hmm. just turn your brain off. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a, there's a mystical experience. I think that, mm -hmm. that, uh, that goes clearly goes beyond the intellect mm -hmm. and what the intellect can do. And I would agree. But I would also say that and warn that people some people do tr essentially turn off the other part of its thinking mm. that they kind of go into this kind of airy fairy realm of where everything is possible. And basically if you believe something, it's true. And that, right. I, that to me is, you know, often the mistake is made by people with great intentions of openness and, you know, trying to understand the universe and not be uh, blinded by presuppositions and prejudices. But if you're in that state of, complete openness, you're much more easily led and manipulated and fascism <laughs> could take cold with a, sure. a population of people that are easily swayed by things without, uh, you know, rational argument uh, simply because it's, it, it feels right or the beliefs are, right. are more important. Yeah. So there's a danger to that. You know, it's that pendulum. I, I like to encourage people, if, if I see the world is too rational and structured, I will be the guy out clowning and telling people that we should, you know, be a little silly and do whatever. But if right. I find that everyone's kind of going crazy in an orgiastic frenzy all the time, right. I'm probably the guy that's going to say, hey, let's get our shit together right. and think about this a little bit. So I feel like I'm kind of going more towards that lately. It's right. like the last few years have been uh, more of a Bacchic, uh, orgiastic, yeah. ecstatic view of the world and, right. and trying kind of to eschew a, a structure and, uh, and, and, you know, relishing in that, that openness. But... Mm -hmm. It leads to madness. <laughs> well, it's interesting. <laughs> you gotta uh, bring it back a little. Yeah, no, it's very interesting. I think. Uh, I mean, my view on that subject is. Uh, um, well, number one, these things aren't mutually exclusive, right? Mm -hmm. But but number two, I mean, you you are, uh, uh, you know, you're educated, mm -hmm. you're a rational guy, you know, you're you're an intellectual. Um, I don't think you can, uh, run the risk of not being that, mm -hmm. no. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the thing is, is, uh, sure your pendulum can swing one way or the other, but you're still drawing from all those things. Mm -hmm. Um, and I would, uh, I would, uh, think that people 
you know, you have a brain, you can reason for for a reason. Mm -hmm. And uh, the moment you let go of your rational faculties, you're walking a really slippery slope, mm -hmm. no matter what it is that you've decided mm -hmm. to embrace. Um, so clearly, I, you know, I, I certainly wouldn't, uh, I, I, I don't, uh, I, I don't, you know, I think there's a big danger in, in doing mm -hmm. that kind of thing. But, um, you know, people, you know, if, if you, if you have, if you're drawing from that, if you have that, you're always drawing from it. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, uh, uh, someone who just, uh, it doesn't it hasn't really exercised their reason whether they become a new age person or whether mm -hmm. they embrace it to a particular type of philosophy or uh you know whatever it's it's going to you know nothing's going to stop them it's going to be the same right. situation no matter what happens um so yeah i think i guess what i'm trying to get at is i think uh we can uh we need to be uh, confident that we can be, we mm -hmm. can draw from everything that we've accumulated over the course of a lifetime mm -hmm. and know that's our, maybe that's, that's our certainty that we're drawing from ourselves and what we have, mm -hmm. even if that, that is uh, limited and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. finite and, uh, you know, uh, whatever. But yeah. you're, you're drawing, I think, Ideally, we're drawing and mm -hmm. we're presenting and we're we're engaging yeah. uh, with everything we have in the best way we can. Yeah, it seems like an integration is is the goal in terms of integration. Integration. Them. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wholeness. Mm -hmm. F fusion. Bringing everything together. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it seems that uh, the world is set up in such a way that we reward through and i don't mean monetarily but through attention through uh positive reinforcement we reward those that are on one or the other end of this pendulum that is they are hyper rational intellectual or they're hyper orgiastic artistic and uh we really seem to encourage that uh i mean the you know you got the mythical stories of the true artist and his it is madness uh being creative and you got uh, you know, mythical stories of these geniuses, you know, being forgetful and writing their formulas on, on you know, they got all these. Uh, so we have encouragement and reinforcement to, to be like that. But uh, the trick, I think, is to go there when necessary, but uh, don't stay there. Um, yes, I, 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 I totally yeah. agree with you. Uh, mm. uh, Other ways. Uh, otherwise, it, it, it's harmful to you, probably. Sure. Too extreme. Yeah. Well, the thing that, uh, you know, you mentioned that we tend to gravitate towards these types of stories, and mm -hmm. this is true. Uh, they're more lively and more dramatic, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, it's uh, the, the, the truth is overrated. <laughs> What's interesting is what, what makes people sit up and take notice. Yeah. Um, so sure, the the idea of the hyper rational Richard Dawkins is a lot mm -hmm. more interesting than mm -hmm. someone who's probably more integrated and uh, mm -hmm. a little bit more even keeled in terms of uh, yeah. Uh, so yeah, mm -hmm. you know that's how that's how we that's how we entertain ourselves. That's that's our that's popcorn, true. I think. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of our own personal development, I think clearly we have to be. Uh, you know, uh, more mature and much more hmm. uh, sensible, hmm. right? Uh, I wanted to ask you before I forget, uh, tarot cards. Yeah, tarot. Let's talk tarot. about tarot. Yeah. Well, yeah, right, because this is a great <laughs> time for you to, to tell everybody that I actually do tarot and, uh, you know, well, let them know that, you're that, writing something <laughs> that, 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 you're, you're that writing I'm actually it. out the other side, right? I'm <laughs> no, out no, the no. window. I'm just curious uh, how it all fits in. Yeah, tarot cards. Okay, well, tarot cards. Um, many years ago, back in 2004, I brought a filmmaker to mm -hmm. Toronto. Mm -hmm. His name was Alejandro Hodorowski. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you've heard of him. He's a master. Yeah. He's a master. He's a, mm -hmm. a filmmaker, c comic, uh, actor, director, mm -hmm. and uh, tarot uh, card reader or tarologist, actually, he calls mm -hmm. himself. So, um, well, at that time, I had obviously didn't know anything about tarot cards. Mm -hmm. 
Um, you know, they were right up there with crystal balls and things like that. Um, he was the first person who spoke to me about the tarot cards in a way that was uh, uh, quite, uh, I would say, sensible or intriguing. Right. Didn't um, seem too flaky. <laughs> no, actually, it's, right. it seemed uh, more like a, a psychological tool. Right. Um, a tool of self-exploration, and mm -hmm. he spoke about it. He uses words like magic and things like that, but, uh, right. you know, uh, psychomagic, actually. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it was all very interesting, and um, I started looking into them uh, around that time or a little a, a little bit later, and um, just started doing uh, exercises with them and kind of trying to you know, read more about them and mm -hmm. understand where they came from and some of the superstitions associated with them and, um, you know, how people look at them. Of course, a lot of uh, tarot card lore is uh, riddled <coughs> with some really bad, you know, it's, it amounts up to bad superstition. It's mm. right up there with astrology and things like that. Right. Um, you know, divination, which mm. I'm not... Uh, in other words, reading the future, right. which I'm not interested in reading the future, and um, you know, I don't, I don't. Even if I could read the future, I don't know what uh, benefit it could possibly. So have. it's more of a self-discovery tool or a self-analysis, or is it? Yeah, uh, what it is is essentially mm -hmm. a. Uh, it's it's a uh, um, uh, a tool for. Uh, you could say self discovery self exploration mm -hmm. uh it certainly it it gives you a kind of uh, or it provides a map of uh for for uh, lack of a better word of the soul in other mm -hmm. words you're you're internally it, it's a, it's a way of understanding the self certainly not the only way to understand the self um but uh um, I really connected with it. I think mm -hmm. it's there's a lot of wisdom there outside of y using them, uh, the cards like drawing mm -hmm. them mm -hmm. or making readings. Just in terms of the map of of uh, of, yeah. of uh, does it deal in archetypes? Uh, it? Yes, it does in, okay. in part deal with archetypes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, so essentially, the idea that every human being, whether man or woman, is uh, essentially goes through stages mm -hmm. that, you know, everyone will go through stages. Everyone has certain stages. They see themselves mm -hmm. as a hero or as a, as a, as a seductor or seduced, a, a mm -hmm. father, a mother, a brother, you know, there, there's all these stages. Um, and so, um, you, you know, it's one way you, you begin to understand yourself. Uh, also the, the idea that everyone's uh, masculine and feminine, that there's feminine components to you and there's masculine mm -hmm. components to you. Um, again, you know, it's not, uh, it's, it's not something that's uh, set in stone. I just find it very helpful. And mm -hmm. I, that's sort of how I, how right. I go into it. It's, mm -hmm. it's not about, uh, and I've told this to many people, that when you start doing something like tarot cards, um, you're, not trying to, uh, you're not trying to find facts. Mm -hmm. You're not trying to determine what is factual right. um you're trying to determine what is helpful mm. and so the tarot cards are primarily a device that speaks to the inner self mm. uh and the inner self is the the subjective self the mm -hmm. the 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 world of uh of uh of imagination of instinct emotion memory mm -hmm. in other words not facts mm. they're internal facts i guess you could call them but i'd Prefer not to use the word facts. They're beliefs. Are they interpretations? Is that uh, well? Everything because it that, seems like when you're presented a card, mm -hmm. there's a sense, there's an element of randomness in a sense. That yes, you don't know what's coming up and yeah. how the duck is shuffled. Mm -hmm. But then once it does arrive, you are to then interpret it. Right. And isn't it more the act of interpretation that's interesting in this case? Because Absolutely. it's different every time, isn't it? Yeah. Absolutely. Well, okay. it's it's they're kind of like uh, in this sense they function like mirrors. So ultimately, anytime you look at a tarot card mm -hmm. and you uh, interpret it, you're you're seeing yourself, an right. aspect of yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I'm not getting, I'm not going to get into the idea of reading tarot cards mm -hmm. for others. So okay. I don't, I don't yeah. do that. But uh, and that's a, a separate discussion. But in terms of using it for yourself and your own um, 
you know, self development. Um, yeah, you're looking. You're essentially looking mm. at mirrors all the time. So you, there's this. Uh, I don't know if this is somehow it seems related to me, but sometimes they say that if you can't decide uh, what you want, mm-hmm. is to flip a coin. Mm-hmm. But it's not so much the coin flip. It's note how you react to the result. Ah. Mm-hmm. So if you say, heads I do this, tails I don't. And if heads come up and you go, ah, shit, right. <laughs> like without thinking about it, <laughs> right. it's, it's how you react it right. is what you really want. Sure. So in a way that tarot seems, the card, it seems kind of like that. Like you, you see the card, but it's mm-hmm. how you're reacting to it and interpreting it that's revealing something about you. So the self-discovery is through the interpretation right. of what's presented to you. Absolutely. I think that uh, the thing is once you start uh, delving into it more and integrating it and... Uh, uh, really interesting things start start to happen, mm. um, and it becomes the whole. Uh, you know, I I don't know. It's it's a, it's it just becomes uh, really interesting. I don't know really what it is. Uh, what's happening? Um, sometimes, sometimes mm-hmm. I could certainly explain it completely psychologically. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I've been kind of maybe I don't know. Maybe not so much. Uh, Pardon me? You get a little woo-woo? A little bit, yeah. Uh, But that's not, you know, that's not my focus. Mm -hmm. It's not whether, you know, to try to understand how they work. Um, Mm -hmm. I think my interest is mainly psychological. Mm -hmm. Uh, But, um, you know, recognizing that there's a lot of stuff going inside you that's not simply Mm -hmm. brain-oriented. Anyway, so the reason I'm writing this book is because uh, most of the books that I've came across regarding the tarot seem to be uh you know written by flakes and there's really <laughs> nothing very interesting there um i don't know just i really can't well connect because i think I many say. of them have within it a component that's built in or baked in of exploitation in the sense that people writing them are often trying to create a career for themselves where right. they go and charge people money to to divinate essentially right, right. right. so that's yeah. automatically not trustworthy. <laughs> sure, <laughs> sure, absolutely. Whereas you seem to be doing it more for, for, for discovery. and Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think that uh, definitely there's certain things I've discovered that, you know, I haven't really read in any books. Uh, maybe they have been written. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I think it can be helpful to a lot of people and sort mm-hmm. of uh, can be a tool to mm-hmm. uh, deepen the mystery, to, to open... Th- Mm-hmm. things up to open up certain doors do it in a very uh uh in a in a way that makes very deep sense to you as an individual because mm-hmm. the cards are so malleable because mm-hmm. there's no writing on them if you compare them to a text almost like a like a, let's say like a religious text there's mm-hmm. no text right it's just an it's encyclopedia true. of pictures, and you put them in certain orders that are randomly yeah, chosen. There's a lot you, of room. Oh, yeah. You Which just, is great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's mm-hmm. nothing. There's mm-hmm. kind of like an oral tradition around them, mm-hmm. but those are kind of the rudimentary ingredients, and then after that. They're malleable. The fact that they're not written down is actually what makes it more powerful. And that Absolutely. they can change with the times and with the reader. Mm-hmm. Uh, so how does, uh, do you know how Alejandro uses it in his filmmaking and his art and are you using it for your art in some sense uh well okay alejandro uses it uh he has used it in his films he's done some films uh around uh, mm-hmm. so, you know uh, the symbolism of the tarot so he believes um that the symbols of the tarot are very powerful and uh that essentially your mind is uh is um, that the the language of the unconscious is metaphor. And so uh, when you speak in metaphors or Mm. you're ingesting metaphors, that you're speaking directly to the unconscious, Mm. and that's how it... I see. Okay. So uh, with with cinema, clearly you're you're dealing with images, moving images, so you're putting those symbols there. And, you know, uh, so he's very interested in, in all of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, me personally, well, sure. I mean, I, <clears throat> I, uh, I'm not. Uh, you know, my films aren't surreal, uh, like Alejandro's or anything like that. But uh, certainly, those mm-hmm. preoccupations are there. I think. Uh, I, I don't know. I'm going to make more movies, but one of the things that keeps coming back in my scripts is there's a regard for the internal world. You know, the the mm-hmm. subjective world, which is 
quite large and yeah. involved and uh, and uh, and interesting and uh, frightening and uh, and uh, you know uh, uh, layered as you know as much as the sort of external world but these are two different worlds um you know cl clearly they interact and and so on and so forth but uh but um i think they're at at, at the core of our understanding of mm -hmm. of reality one of the reasons why we're always dividing the world into two things is hmm. is uh you know, uh, the reason we divide the entire world into two worlds, why we talk mm -hmm. about the afterlife and mm -hmm. the material world and the other spooky world and why there's issues about God and this and that is because one corresponds to the internal world, which is where imagination reigns and where things of this nature can happen. And then there's the external world, which mm -hmm. is the material du world of facts and science, right? Duality is everywhere. Duality is everywhere. It's another mm -hmm. grand theme in the tarot cards, but the mm -hmm. duality. But the interesting thing is not only to identify these things, but uh, I guess the tarot cards give you a uh, an idea of how these themes can develop in your life and how, mm -hmm. how you can develop them. And mm -hmm. I, I guess an, a way, I would say maybe maybe not an optimum way, but certainly one of the optimum ways in which you can kind of grow to become a a full human being mm -hmm. and, and, and in, in this case would be a whole human being mm -hmm. so that's a little bit about whole the and holy whole and holy <laughs> there you go <laughs> whole and holy absolutely well uh thanks for coming in again you're very welcome jake yeah you're always welcome anytime well thanks man you i'll be chat. back we'll yeah. chat some more we'll chat some We'll talk trash next time. Let's do it. High five. All right. Right on. Cheers. <laughs> That's great. That's fun. <laughs>